Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on managing your fermentations with Christian Hansen yeast. I want to thank everyone. I know that you could be anywhere. There's many different webinars going on right now, uh, but you chose to be with us and we appreciate it. My name is David Spector and I'm joining you from Venice Beach, California. And today I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Lorenzo Pyre at our headquarters in Copenhagen and our commercial development manager, Ann Claire. Lorenzo is going to be leading the technical presentation today and Ann Claire will be supporting us during our question and answer period at the end. Before we get into the presentation, I want to thank our distributor, Guzmer. Guzmer is more than just a distributor. Uh, for us, they're a true partner. They're not just doing sales and distribution. Uh, they are working uh, with us on application work. They are taking feedback uh, from you, from the industry, and bringing it back to our application teams, our production teams in both North America and Europe so that we can get the right products for the industry. So make sure you continue uh, to tell your Guzmer reps what you need, what you want, and what you like uh, so we can deliver that for you. Next slide. Just going to take a, a minute to introduce Christian Hansen. Who are we? Uh, we are a global biotechnology company with the world's, li world's largest library of bacteria. And we may have been around for 145 years, but that doesn't mean that we're not innovative. Uh, we've been innovative in the wine industry, obviously, the first ones to bring frozen Enococcus eni to market, the first ones to release a wide range of non-saccharomyces yeast, which we're going to talk about in, in depth, but we've done it for other markets, other fermentation markets as well, meat, dairy, produce, beer. Next slide. Doing what is right for the business is important for us, um, but what, doing what is right for the world is even more important for us, and that's why we've been named the world's most sustainable company in 2000. 19 and that is something uh, that we continue continuously work on and in a post coronavirus world uh, we want to make sure that our supply chain is strong and so you can rest easy at night knowing uh, that you are going to get the products that you need we have production facilities in Europe and in North America our closest production plan is in Milwaukee Wisconsin. Uh, so when you need your product, Guzmer uh, will be there to deliver it for you. Next slide. We all know that environmental yeast and bacteria can carry out the alcoholic and malolactic fermentation, and this can certainly yield great results. But you must understand your vineyard and your winery's microflora if you don't want to leave yourself up to the chance. So much of what we're going to talk about today is control. Understanding what microorganisms are coming into the process and using commercial strains to help you achieve your desired goals. Next slide. Our product line for wine is Vinaflora. So we have a number of products. We have non-saccharomyces yeast, which we're going to talk about today for pre-alcoholic fermentation. We have Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast for alcoholic fermentation. And finally, uh, we have a range of lactic acid bacteria for malolactic fermentation. Next slide. We had Guzmer and Christian Hansen like to think of winemaking as uh, three distinct fermentation. You have the pre-alcoholic fermentation with the rise and fall of the non-saccharomyces yeast. Uh, once you have produced enough ethanol, you have Saccharomyces cerevisiae dominating the fermentation. And 
finishing out primary fermentation. And if you are conducting a sequential inoculation, you have enococcusini completing the malolactic uh, fermentation. Next slide. Our yeast and bacteria products can not only prevent the growth of undesirable flora, protecting the quality of your wine, uh, but it can also differentiate your wine as well. You can use non-saccharomyces yeast to enhance the flavor, to produce mouthfeel, really setting apart your wines uh, from the competition. So there are a lot of Vinaflor resources that you can obtain. Uh, you can go to the guzmerwine.com website um, and you can find their catalog there which has tons of information about our yeast and bacteria products. And uh, you can also reach out to uh, your local rep and they have been equipped uh, with all the information uh, that you'll need for our yeast and bacteria products. All right, well enough from me. Let's give it over to Lorenzo, the, the person that you all signed up to see. Lorenzo is currently working as a senior application manager in the Department of Wine and Fermented Beverages at Christian Hansen in Copenhagen, Denmark. After completing Lorenzo's PhD in Cork, Ireland, he came to us as an application manager and he's really focused in on our enology uh, products as well as developing new concepts on other fermented beverage substrates. So without further ado, Lorenzo, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, David, and welcome to everybody. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Lorenzo. I, I joined this, uh, this team in, uh, in Christian Hansen about three years ago, uh, mostly focusing on wine. Um, I'm there as a, as a project manager uh, to carry on um, projects and to try to find like the next uh, best culture uh, to bring out in the market, and at the same time also like supporting our team of, uh, of skilled enologists on, on the field. Uh, thank you very much, David, for introduction, and uh, thank you to Gasmer uh, to to provide this uh, this technological platform uh, that allows us to really reach reach out to to our end and customers uh, in this way. So thank you again. So. Um, just let me spend a couple of words about uh, where we are coming from as, as, as Christian Hansen and when the, um, the product range of non-saccharomyces uh, came into play. So we, uh, we started as a, as a dairy company. Uh, so um, some time ago, somebody, somebody clever decided to uh, invest in the wine, in the wine business, uh, by producing bacteria. So because we're coming from a dairy uh, background, uh, bacteria is something that we knew very well. Uh, we knew how to screen it, how to select them, and how to produce them. So there was uh, just quite a no-brainer to start with malolactic bacteria, which uh, we are like a steel world leading company in, uh, in, uh, in this section. But then, um, I think out of uh, um, curiosity, but also um, trying to shake a bit the market uh, of, of in, in, in the wine fermentation, um, in 2004, um, some of my former colleagues decided, well, let's, let's look into non-saccharomyces, um, just to give, uh, to give possibility to the winemaker to, to explore uh, some of the the more like um, angularity or like more the extremes that they can get out from, from the wine um, by exactly like trying to select some of non-saccharomyces that are present in spontaneous vinification anyway, but in a way that we selected a good one um, with good profiles and that we can apply them in a, in a controlled way. So it's in a way um, trying to simulate a spontaneous fermentation but in a, in a controlled way and without the risks of it. So you can see uh, that we started this, um, let's maybe do it like that. Uh, we started in 2004 by uh, providing to our customer a, a blend of saccharomyces and non-saccharomyces. So in this blend, um, the different blends, but 
in general, they are like mix Saccharomyces and Saccharomyces for different purposes. After five years, uh, we decided to uh, to give the opportunity to the winemakers to explore with singular uh, non-saccharomyces. So we started to uh, introduce the, the single cultures. Uh, in 2009, we were the first one uh, doing so, and uh, the first uh, strain that we uh, proposed was a Togolas del Brookie. Then one year later, we, um, we selected Epicia Cluri, and one year after that, we proposed the single culture of La Chanza Thermotolerance. In a way, also to give the, uh, the winemakers that explored, let's say, with the blend, the possibility of using their own saccharomyces in conjunction with one of these non-saccharomyces. Well, um, as being like a, a biotechnological company, um, our, our aim in the, in, let's say, a strain selection always refers back to uh, what are the challenges and what are the trends that um, are, are present in the, in the wine industry, sometimes even mega trends. And probably the first one um, really represents something that everybody is struggling um, to, to eat, is that um, no matter what you're doing in agriculture, you are um, you experience like a changing world uh, in terms of uh, of temperature. Temperature are uh, are getting hotter, um, and depending where you are, latitude wise, uh, with your uh, winery, um, it can lead to wines that they uh, they start to lack of balance. Uh, they might be too alcoholic. They might have lost the, the freshness. So that's something, one of the trends that we're looking uh, into it. At the same time, uh, the, the consumer, the end consumer, the, the wine drinker, is also asking for um, health-related trends. Um, in this case, like the reduction of sulfites. Um, this because its sulfites are, uh, are connected to some, some pseudo allergies. And uh, in general, they have like a... Um, somewhat a negative connotation to, um, to, to consumption. So um, this also relates to the first trend in terms that um, with wine and, and, and grapes losing some of the acidity, the pH also starts to rise, and we know that the sulfite efficiency very much depends on the, on the final pH of the wine. So if the pH goes up, sulfites uh, they do start to lose some of the efficiency, so you need to add even more. So they're very much correlated. And finally, maybe a little bit more like a, a commercial approach, but clearly the trend is you, you want to stand out from, uh, from competition. So um, really here we are looking for uh, a product, uh, a way to diversify your product uh, to make it uh, basically uh, somewhat uh, more appealing to the to the final consumer, and this we all think that in a way um, there are trends and there are issues that can be resolved in part by using non saccharomyces so again um, by using non saccharomyces you can you can start to um, to answer to the customer demand for diversification uh, that relates to the increased competition that there is in the wine industry, and also like starts to take out from this uh, the, the issues that are related to the to the global warming to that extent, and that's why because really these these non saccharomyces have a, a whole different range of metabolic properties. Um, so the world has been used of using saccharomyces for maybe the last uh, 50 years, uh, making wine making. Uh, to a certain extent, a more reliable process, um, you know, less stuck fermentation, cleaner wines, but also in the process uh, started to lose a little bit those, uh, those edges, those complexity uh, that make probably a wine a little bit more superior than another one. So uh, by, by offering these non-saccharomyces, we also wanted to, to feed easily giving, giving back uh, the complexity of a, of a well-managed spontaneous fermentation. Another very important point is that um, non-saccharomyces are applied at the beginning of um, fermentation. So basically when you have the juice and we have your, your must, 
Um, by applying it at a high inoculation rate, we start to protect the mast in, in terms of uh, we inoculate a high number of cells. These are starting to compete with other indigenous cells for space, for nutrients, for oxygen, and so forth. So indirectly, by using non-saccharomyces, we often find as well a bioprotecting effect. And then finally, as, as I mentioned um, before as well, we, we want to, to kind of like give, give back some of, some of the, the, the beauty of a complexity that, uh, that uh, let's say, a natural fermentation can give as well. But clearly, taking out the risk of, of flavor formation of stack fermentation by directing selection of these non-saccharomyces um, to um, working and uh, good in symbiosis with saccharomyces and malolactic bacteria. So this is uh, very similar to what uh, David has, uh, has mentioned, but um, the application of non-saccharomyces is pretty much restricted to uh, the beginning when you have the juice and the mast. So we are like in condition where you have like a, a lot of sugars. Uh, you do have still an indigenous microflora that comes from the environment. Uh, it's present in the cellar and is there and starts just until you inoculate your saccharomyces. If you do so, it just wants to take over. Um, but we have driven selection of non-saccharomyces uh, for strains they are able to work under this condition of high sugars of sometimes uh, colder temperatures if you're doing cold soaking or cold settling. And it's not just, um, let's say, reserved to uh, the moment when you have uh, the juice or the mass in the tank, but it can go even further back. As soon as you harvest the grapes, you can, you can add some of the saccharomyces, non-saccharomyces, and we see uh, some of the application in a moment. And whatever the non-saccharomyces is doing at this stage, it will influence alcoholic fermentation and it will influence uh, malolactic fermentation by producing um, some compounds or by um, inhibiting other microorganisms that would produce some toxic compounds, for example. So some. Some of my, my clever colleagues, uh, maybe exactly so, 15, 20 years ago in Christian Hansen, they, um, they wanted to venture in this, uh, um, in this realm and this field of non-saccharomyces. And they identified three uh, key parameters and three key uh, challenges that they wanted to answer by selecting uh, non-saccharomyces. And these are increasing flavors and flavor complexity. Uh, by increasing the balance or like restoring a certain balance that maybe got lost by um, environmental factors. And finally, also um, going to tackle some of the, of the mouthfeel, of the, of the body sensation of a wine. And they ended up selecting three non-saccharomyces, um, very different from each other. So for flavor, we have a flavor booster, non-saccharomyces, which is a strain of Pichia cluvery. As a matter of fact, we are the only um, producer of Pichia cluvery, and it's the, the biggest, um, let's say, flavor booster in terms of tiles especially, so like these tropical, uh, tropical flavors on the market. For the acidity balance, we ended up selecting La Chance a tolerance, a strain uh, or a species that normally release some organic acids, lactic acids, um, through their metabolism. And then finally, as well, for the mouthfeel, um, they identified a Toglasporga del Bruchi, uh, which is a strain that, um, um, very interesting, has this, uh, this ability of releasing some of these larger uh, molecules that can affect the harmony, that can affect the body of, of a wine. But let's take it one by one, um, and uh, let me just introduce uh, to, to some of the aspects, maybe three or four key aspects for each of these non-saccharomyces. So we start with uh, chronologically, with our Turgas Pogge del Bruchi. Uh, so we call it Viniflora Pagelud as a commercial name. Um, this was the first um, pure non-saccharomyces being launched for winemaking, and uh, as a matter of fact, the first Togolasporga del Bruchi. Um, nowadays, you will find a Togolasporga del Bruchi 
pretty much in every uh, portfolio from uh, um, East for users. Um, so it's a very popular strain, and uh, we'll see in a moment why why so. So the main features is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as a disability of like releasing some some polysaccharides that can influence um, body um, mouthfeel and can also like maybe mask some of the astringency that you can get some some uh, like heavily macerated wine. Um, it clearly comes with an enzymatic machinery that can release um, um, terpenes, that can release flavors, that can produce de novo, some esters. Um, so um, it clearly has some, some impact there on the flavor complexity. And finally, um, because of the properties of being osmotolerant and cold tolerant, uh, you can add it very early in the process and can, can start to, um, to consume some of the sugars that maybe a saccharomyces would think, oh, that's, that's a little bit too much, start to get stressed and uh, release volatile acidity, while pagelute helps to uh, mitigate the, um, the release of uh, volatile acidity. It looks very much like a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is a little bit smaller if you look it under a microscope, uh, but all these non-Saccharomyces are able to be distinguished if you do like a differential plating on some agar. So, um, as mentioned many times now, um, Prelude is there to um, increase mouthfeel. So it can, uh, during um, budding, so during growing, there's some exponential growth of this strain, some of the polysaccharides um, that are connected to the cell wall of this yeast are being released in the medium, and that's um, what actually like then uh, can can impart like a, a mouthfeel, uh, an increased mouthfeel to some some of uh, some of the wines. At the same time, it also after it, may, it makes its own um, let's say uh, action and life cycle uh, through autolytic. Um, a process, it can release some more of these uh, polysaccharides, which in this specific there are monoproteins. So it's it's a mixture between uh, a sugar um, and a protein that very much resemble what is present on the cell wall. And what it does is it gives the smooth, smoothness, uh, the roundness uh, to the wine, um, and can can touch to the to the stringency, maybe the tanninic stringency, by reducing it a little bit. So if we apply prelude in pre-fermentation um, to longer, right, for a longer uh, action, so for example, here we have prelude applied for two days before inoculation of saccharomyces, and here we have prelude applied for four days, we see that we actually, we, we managed to increase the amount of these monoproteins. So the longer you give to prelude, the more you get of this effect. It's also, uh, for uh, physiological reason, is also uh, an osmotolerant strain. Um, that means that it can thrive to uh, in condition where you have like a lot of sugar uh, present in the mast, and that's that at the beginning of fermentation, especially even if you if you look into into maybe sweet wines, so like sugar concentration higher than 250 key, uh, gra uh, grams per liter, prelude can be added to prevent saccharomyces to build up uh, and to rise the volatile acidity, and also to um, to prevent saccharomyces to release some of the toxic fatty acids that can go later on in the vinification process and disturb. Uh, the malolactic fermentation, especially uh, those fatty acids with C10, C12, that are quite toxic to malolactic bacteria because they can enter in the malolactic bacteria, they can dissociate um, and they can, they can basically um, kill them. So um, here you can see it was a, a, a trial where we had a Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, tank and then one where we added Douglas Pogodelbrucki in pre-fermentation and we see here um, very, very nicely that acetic acid and fatty acid level could actually be decreased. Also, is a cold tolerant strain, and that relates to the to the ability of of this species in general um, to to be able to 
um, accumulates some cryoprotectants, natural cryoprotectants like glycerol, and be able to uh, withstand, um, let's say, colder temperatures. Uh, especially when, when you find like in cold settling and cold soaking. So we see here, for example, that preludes applied in this um, cold settling experiment. We see that um, this manage, the strain managed to increase in cells uh, throughout this incubation, this first incubation of 12 degrees, and then just um, sitting there um, to that extent, also like taking space, and we are talking in a, in a short moment about bioprotection. Um, whereas when we compare to two more of, uh, of the Vinoflora uh, products, we see that they, uh, they cannot come up to the same extent of cell growth. So um, there are very, very good reasons why we push some products for certain application and some not. This one is to illustrate that Prelude can work uh, bioprotectively. Uh, this one is an experiment that we did in, in Cabernet Sauvignon in France in 2000, last year. Uh, so it's a very fresh where there was a, um, a cold soaking of the grape and there has been done some metagenomic analysis. So metagenomic analysis basically looks at uh, DNA that is present in a sample by by basically analyzing um, this DNA and associating it to different species. And so we find that before we inoculate any uh, non-saccharomyces in this uh, must, we have um, some Ancinospora ovarum, so another cult-tolerant strain that you really don't want to have that because can lead then to uh, some ethyl acetate and volatile acidity increase and some environmental uh, yeast on top. And then when we add our non-saccharomyces, uh, we see, uh, and that was done for Concerto and for Prelude in different tanks, we see that uh, Prelude managed to uh, take over. So if we do, again, this metagenomic analysis, you see that the, the species that is most represented, almost 100%, is Togolas de Brookie. That means that has been added there, it started to, um, to grow, take over, um, just take down whatever of indigenous yeast was there, and it allowed uh, most probably to clean your mast. At the same time, the thing doesn't work uh, as well if we use Concerto. So again, if, you, if you're looking into, into a bioprotection during cold soaking or cold settling, uh, we do have specific um, yeast and specific solutions that we can uh, propose you, and especially Prelude works very well. And we see in a moment as well, fruits and for example. And finally, as well mentioned, is that, and that's something that is shared among all the non-saccharomyces, uh, pretty much, is that uh, you, you're gonna touch the aromatic complexity. Uh, because they come with a different, a very much different enzymatic pattern. Um, this, compared to saccharomyces, the non-saccharomyces can release uh, more ester, they can release different uh, flavor compounds, they can, um, release more of the of the thiol precursors, liberate more of the terpenes. So in general, and specifically now for prelude, but in general saccharomyces can increase the aromatic complexity. Um, so if you're talking about you have a grape that maybe aromatically is not uh, is not that interesting or um, is quite bland, neutral, is a high yield grape, so non-saccharomyces can help to lift up the, the aromatic complexity. This one is, a, is an example of a Chardonnay that's been applied with Prelude and then uh, a tank with only saccharomyces. And we see here on the dark blue that um, with Prelude, these tasters could taste more uh, different flavors and different aromas and notes in these wines. So I'm going to summarize um, what Prelude means for us. It, that, it means it's a strain that can uh, help to increase the palate wave by, um, by, decrease, by increasing the amount of these monoproteins. Um, it will touch also on the aromatic complexity. It can bioprotect, especially during cold soaking, due to the fact that it's a, a cold tolerant strain. And in general, it helps to diversify your product. Um, and we, here we are talking about uh, equally red and white. Maybe sometimes it works 
more for reds, but uh, whites has been proven very much uh, very, very valuable. It's a very valuable application as well. And uh, again, here more in detail what it does when you apply it. It can, uh, it can really touch on the, if you have a problem with rising volatile acidity, especially given by indigenous yeast. This is present at the beginning of fermentation. Um, Preludes can be your friend here. Let's move to the next uh, non-saccharomyces. So this, this has been a little bit of a shock to the world because it came with uh, uh, a lot of innovation. In the fact that um, it was the first PTA Cluvery being offered for, for, for wine. It came as a, as a frozen block and it's still offered as a frozen block. Um, so it's, um, um, it's a yeast that is uh, able to be directly inoculated in your must on your grapes. We're going to see it shortly. So it doesn't need any rehydration, reactivation. This yeast you need to, um, to let it defrost in, in, in terms that you need to be able to open the package. Leave 15 minutes until you can open the package and you can throw this, uh, this ice block into your, uh, your juice. It was launched in 2010. Um, most probably, I mean, very comfortably, is the, is the most uh, potent uh, tire precursors releaser uh, that it is in the market. As a matter of fact, it's been, uh, this strain has been selected from uh, a collaborative project that we had with Auckland University in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, where this, this project was looking into uh, selecting the best PK chlory, or the most, the most intensive PK chlory that's, um, that worked for uh, releasing those varietal compounds in uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so we're talking about tiles, uh, varietal tiles. And uh, it's a low fermentative strain, though, uh, in, in terms that uh, you apply to the juice. You normally, uh, we normally suggest to, to apply it 24 to a maximum of 48 hours because um, it doesn't do, you, you won't see a big difference if you, if you go and measure your sugars, if you go measure your alcohol. You won't see difference. You, you're gonna see the difference in the smell. Um, you're gonna you're gonna taste the difference because it doesn't consume a lot of the sugar. It doesn't produce a lot of the alcohol, but it does um, things totally totally different in terms of like flavor precursor conversion and production of flavors. So it's very important to combine it uh, quite soon with a Saccharomyces. So, as mentioned, it's a very flavor active. So, it's your first choice if you have a, um, a good grape, but uh, you, you think like, oh, maybe maybe I'm missing a little bit of uh, of, uh, of aromatic or spikes of uh, especially tropical flavors. So, uh, prelude can, um, uh, fruits and can help very well in this, and. With, with the years and the more and more application, we have seen as well that uh, fruits and can help and has a, a significant impact in, uh, in bioprotection. So more and more winemakers are experimenting and setting up a protocol for applying this strain uh, as soon as you have uh, your, your grape uh, being collected and harvested in a way to protect, to start to protect your, your grape against, uh, let's say, indigenous microbiota, but also against oxidation. And we're going to see it in a moment how that works. Again, it's, a, it's an ice block, so um, uh, it comes uh, with uh, logistics that is, uh, is kept at minus 50, minus 45 uh, Celsius, degrees Celsius. Normally, we ask like 10 or 15 minutes uh, to take it out uh, to be able to actually cut it and then release it from the plastic wrap, and then it can be added as basically almost launched in the um, in the tank, or like thaw it completely and then pumped in the tank. This is just a representation on how uh, a winemaker uh, applies applies fruits, and so you see that that's pretty much really like an ice block that goes uh, directly in the tank. So forget about rehydration, reactivation, it saves a lot of time as well. As mentioned before, so the 
um, the original and the traditional application of this uh, strain is um, in the pre-alcoholic fermentation, like other non-saccharomyces, uh, for flavor intensity. But more and more with the, with the years, we also like started to applying um, upstream to the process. So as soon as you have the harvested grapes uh, for bioprotection. And uh, especially here has been tested a lot in, in, in Europe, in France and Spain for winemakers that were looking into, into making wine uh, without any added sulfite and worked very well. Um, and in cold settling as well, so you can add it a little bit later in the process uh, on the pressed grapes. And here we can see that um, clearly you, you add it for a bioprotection purpose, but you also start to influence the flavor. If you, um, if clearly there is a clarification that uh, it's aimed to, um, you know, to, to clarify very well your, your juice, uh, sometimes we need to, if, you, if you're still looking for a big flavor uh, impression, sometimes we, uh, we recommend to do um, a smaller second uh, application in the juice afterwards, because clearly, especially with flotation, for example, you can remove uh, some of the um, of the cells, especially if you're using ketosan. But uh, it's it's a very um, multi multi-dimensional yeast, uh, and it can be applied pretty much at every stage. This is this is an example on how uh, how this has been applied. So the fruits and has been thawed and then applied um, either mixed like with a little bit of water or a little bit of must and then applied on the harvested grapes for bioprotection purposes and also uh, avoid oxidation. So to a certain extent, we we want to take some of the um, of the uh, application that sulfites normally do as an antioxidant and antimicrobial by applying a natural solution. And this is a case study uh, done in France uh, two years ago uh, on a unpast uh, sorry, in a unsulfited Grenache Cri in a in a wine in a winery that was used to pasteurize their Grenache Cri because they were like focused on unsulfited wine. But uh, during that year, they decided, well, let's try with non-saccharomyces and see what's the effect. And they tried fruits and, and compared it with two um, non-saccharomyces available on the, on commercially. And uh, we found the fruits and has been able to, this is again a metagenomic result, has been able to um, basically clean the the, uh, the must and clean the juice in terms of leaving non, uh, the saccharomyces, the inoculated saccharomyces, to thrive throughout alcoholic fermentation. So these are metagenomic data from the final wine. When we see though the other non-saccharomyces, maybe they worked not that well in terms that we we still see a certain amount of non-spoilages at the end of fermentation, alcoholic fermentation. And here is a complete mess uh, about non-saccharomyces yeast and some some other yeast that shouldn't be really there. Also, the rosé that has been produced with uh, with fruits and has also scored better. Uh, in terms of uh, of color, uh, it's a little bit more brighter. Um, it's not that almost like brown oxidized colors um, that you can find in, in if you if you don't have maybe a control uh, regarding your oxygen intrusion uh, because you don't use sulfites. And we see as well, I mean, um, picia cruri uh, compared to a Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a is a is a species that love oxygen in terms that if there is oxygen in the environment, it will it will consume it with sugars to um, to produce biomass uh, to release flavor compounds, but it doesn't do a whole lot of fermentation, so it needs to consume basically the oxygen that is present before it can switch into fermentation. Very much unlikely a saccharomyces that can do that straight away. And the big, the big plus of this uh, of this species in general, and I think of this strain in particular, is that as a, is very is very potent on releasing thiol precursors. So these are, are normally uh, bound in a in an odorless uh, form. 
uh, and molecules and if you have the right enzymes you can release these tires and then you have a grapefruit and you have passion fruits um, flavors that are coming up for for example this is this is a wine that's been done with a saccharomyces only and we see a certain amount of tiles and then we see if we add fruits and in co-inoculation with saccharomyces we can increase some of these tiles if we can add fruits and in sequential almost like before like one or two days before the saccharomyces we see that it can increase even more the release of these tiles so it's a very important flavor booster and it doesn't only release tiles you also produce uh, de novo esters. Um, these are medium chain fatty acid esters um, that's anomaly uh, expressing even more like fruity, like we, we have here like a pineapple, apricots uh, flavors. And we see here um, very clearly that the influence of fruits and is very significant in terms that if you eat fruits and uh, you can increase. Um, this, this ester by 50%, ethyl decanoate, for example, as small apricot and, and, and sweet, 11%. I mean, it's a significant increase, and, uh, and that's why we, we, we are basically um, commercializing it for and pushing it for being this uh, amazing flavor um, promoter. Finally, so the strength is boost fruit aroma in all varieties. So, let's say as a as a prerogative, as a, as a focus has been applied in, in white and more and more in rosé, uh, less in red wines, but at the same time has been working very well as well in, in red wines. Maybe like more like the, uh, the softer red wines, like a Pinot Noir, where it can express, for example, a black currant uh, flavor. And then again, this bioprotection. So if you're looking into, into producing a white wine or a rosé wine uh, that um, you want to go into the, the venture of not adding any sulfites, um, fruits and can help you uh, to achieve basically this uh, this goal. Again, it can uh, um, it, it clearly can increase the variety of character in Sauvignon Blanc that was selected for. But as well, if you have high yield, low aromatic grapes, it can be a, a very uh, useful um, way to increase the aromatic and then maybe as a blending tool uh, to to mix again this um, this, this tanks. Uh, to achieve a certain certain balance. Lorenzo, Finally, we have we... some good questions coming in, so we'll start the Q and A period in five minutes. Okay. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah <laughs> I'm gonna speed up. Finally, we have a La Chance Thermotolerance um, product name Concerto, launched a, a little bit uh, later as a single single culture. Because of the metabolism, um, you release acids, lactic acid, so you can improve acidity balance. Uh, by doing that, it also starts to uh, take some of the sugar and reserving them to produce lactic acid and not ethanol. Uh, so it can reduce slightly the alcohol level, and finally, it also um, it also active as producing esters, especially more like a red, uh, red like fresher esters. Very very simplistic. So if you take a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You put it in a, in a in mass, you have a sugar conversion. You have biomass clearly like being produced, but fermentation will you produce ethanol, CO2, and some some uh, side uh, metabolites. With the Lachanza thermal tolerance, you have another major metabolite that being produced with by the sugars is lactic acid, and by doing that, you clearly you start uh, influencing the total acidity of your wine. You start to reduce the pH. Of your final wine, with the side effect of like making sulf, uh, sulfites uh, being more efficient if we're using the pH, and again, like we have seen um, in, um, in in some instances, that it can also start to reduce some of the ethanol uh, content in your final wine. Again, because it produces lactic acid, uh, this can spontaneously uh, combine with the ethanol present after alcoholic fermentation. To produce ethyl lactate, ethyl lactate is a is a flavor compound that is uh, softer, creamy. Um, it's very much on the on the on the berry spectrum, um, and uh, exactly that's that's something that you will see significantly improved if you add concerto or la chance thermal tolerance in general. 
bioprotection, as mentioned, all, all our non-SAC have a bioprotection effect. Uh, they do rely on different uh, mode of actions. But Concerto, because you can release lactic acid, lactic acid is, is an acid, so it starts to, um, to influence um, the, the population, especially of, uh, of acidic acid bacteria, but also the population of, uh, of molds and uh, indigenous yeast. So what it does as well is clearly you inoculate and it takes space. It's there, we see here that's on a, on a grape juice, after being inoculated with Concerto, we see that after alcoholic fermentation, the majority of the, um, the DNA present is actually relates to La Chance de So it's a very much like, um, you know, uh, taking, taking the, 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 the role um, around. Um, yeah, finally, very quickly, the strength is that increased acidity by, uh, um, because metabolically is working to produce lactic acid. It adds fruitiness uh, by losing some of the special esters and um, yeah, helps also to produce wine without sulfides when you're combining with certain protocols. Um, this clearly, uh, the application uh, works very well if you have like a red wines or fortified wines, like wines that are coming from hot climates that are starting to miss some of this uh, acidity balance and freshness. So that works very well of giving back some of this balance. This is an emblematic uh, slice just to show you like that in the same, um, let's say, substrate um, canvas, these three different product, uh, product can, um, can bring three different wines. Uh, so in this has been, has been tested on a rosé um, in um, produced in La Manche in Spain, where fruits has been applied. And we see like that it enhances fruitiness, a little bit of, of the cherry notes. We have a prelude clearly it goes and touch a little bit of the body and a little bit more like of the, of the jammy, um, more like a body full flavors and, uh, and concerto uh, that's again touches a little bit of acidity, a little bit more the fresh red berries. So really much like this uh, non-saccharomyces, they need to be taken as a toolbox uh, for, the, for the winemaker. Then finally, we have also blends. So basically we started with blends uh, in, our, in our chronology. And here I present you three, three of them. So we have a, a blend that are comprising of one saccharomyces and two non-saccharomyces. And we have blend where comprising, for example, with them, where we, uh, and where we put like a little bit of focus on, on a non-saccharomyces with a saccharomyces and we meet another. Uh, non-saccharomyces, but that's, they, these blends are being, are being used for different purposes. So, uh, Melody very, very shortly has been, uh, has been very successfully increasing flora and tropical fruit aromas, especially in dried white in Chardonnay and round mouthfeel. So this one comprised of prelude or concerto. So now you know what the single strain do. So if you put them in, in, in together, um, in symbiosis to that extent, you, you start to, to comprehend what the single are doing. And blends are pretty much probably the, the, the easiest step to enter the non-saccharomyces world. And uh, um, yes, exactly. I mean, there are like a lot of, a lot of advantages in terms of the, it saves the preparation uh, in terms that you have already the saccharomyces as well in the blend. So you don't have to do a, like a, a sequential inoculation and it's the closest, let's say, to a spontaneous uh, fermentation to that extent, but controlled. And uh, harmony, very similar to melody, but we decrease a little bit of the saccharomyces ratio just to get a little bit of subtle, um, but still giving a, a multidimensional uh, aspect to the wine. And rhythm, again, is a combination between sac saccharomyces and La Chancea. And here, if you want to go for fruit forward and uh, let's say like go and touch us to the fruits. But here, I, I would leave it to, to the very skilled people of, uh, of Gasmer and, and Christian Hansen to, to really much like trying to fit a product to your wine and to your wishes. This is um, a summary of the products that I just uh, told. So this, this is all information that you're going you're gonna to find on the Gasmer website as well. And finally, well, the product comes as well with 
uh, specifications. It comes with, uh, with uh, inoculation protocol. We will explain how it inoculated, for which kind of application, and uh, well, our, all our products are also validated for uh, organic wine production. So that's also important to know. And here, yes, I want to, to thank you again for, for giving me like the, the spotlight and uh, being able to, to talk almost one, uh, being present to, to, our, to our customer uh, in, in the Central Valley. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, Lorenzo. I appreciate that. All right. So I will start my video again. Yeah. So if you have any questions, uh, you are looking for support or products, you know, go to the Guzmer website. Uh, obviously, this webinar was hosted by Guzmer. Uh, so you probably have been a longtime customer. You can find your local rep if you don't uh, know who they are on the Guzmer uh, website. So we will open it up for questions. And you can write your question in the chat box. Or if you want to unmute uh, your microphone, you can ask your question. But we do have one in the chat box uh, right now for you, Lorenzo. And we can get that. A conversation started. We have about 10 minutes for the question and answer period. If you don't have time to ask your question, just email your local Guzma rep and uh, they'll have an answer for you. Okay, so Lorenzo, can you touch on the mechanism of reduced alcohol with Concerto? Yes, yes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good question, a relevant question. Um, so, um, well, the mechanism is, is, is quite uh, straightforward in the fact that this, this strain, I think, for um, a way of being competitive in, uh, in certain media, um, for a certain reason, he started to produce, to want to produce lactic acid as a side product. Uh, because by doing that, it's, it's a classic um, antimicrobial and uh, um, competitive advantage a mechanism to reduce the pH so that other microorganisms will start to have get, get their uh, the life a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, so the mechanism works as um, sugar is, is normally uh, converted maybe to seven, 17 gram per uh, um, 17 gram of sugar converted to 1% of uh, ethanol, uh, for example, in Saccharomyces. Well, this La Chance thermotolerance needs more sugar because some of it is being produced in lactic acid. And you can enhance lactic acid production by, by clearly um, favoring this, um, this product over, over Saccharomyces. So, for example, by, uh, first of all, by giving, um, say, um, not one day or not a co-inoculation, but giving like two or three days of uh, inoculation alone without the saccharomyces in the must, this strain can start to produce more lachantia. If you uh, feed, um, if you control your um, yeast assimilable nitrogen in a, in a right way, you can also give uh, more chances to Lachanza to be present later on when he's then in co-inoculation with Saccharomyces because clearly uh, you add two competitors, let's say, two, two, two microorganisms in the same substrate and they have um, different but they have also similar um, um, request for the nitrogen. So you need to be to make sure that uh, your Saccharomyces can feed um, and can still be operative in, in the mast by controlling your yarn. We are talking here, when we are talking about non-Saccharomyces, if you can have like, uh, let's say, 200 milligram per liter of initial yarn, then you should be like on the safe side, 180 and 200. Often what we ask as well, um, uh, as a part of the protocol is when you add saccharomyces, you would add some of the ammonium uh, that just to, um, to feed the saccharomyces and the non-saccharomyces can feed further on the other nitrogen. And oxygen plays also a role. Um, so um, oxygen, let's say our non-saccharomyces are more reliable, are more related, or they need more oxygen than, let's say, Saccharomyces. Uh, if oxygen goes out, 
um, they, uh, they will start fermentation, but they're not as efficient as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So if at the beginning of fermentation you do have like a, a healthy level of uh, oxygen, that will favor your La Chanza to, to thrive and to, to produce lactic acid, thus reducing ethanol. All right. Well, thank you. And you know, I'll just speak from my experience going out to wineries with the Guzma reps and just make the disclaimer that there is no silver bullet using a Lachanza thermotolerance isn't going to lower your ethanol um, by two percentage points. You know, it is going to be a tool that you can use, um, but you have to be mindful of your viticulture practices and your starting uh, bricks. It's certainly something that you can use to help you achieve more acidity, lower ethanol uh, within a, a holistic winemaking regime. Okay, we have another question for you, Lorenzo. I believe that you have uh, some recent experience with this. Uh, are any products recommended for sparkling wines, especially the base wines? Sorry, for which kind of wine? For sparkling wines. Ah, for sparkling wines. Okay, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Um, hmm. Well, we are working. We actually working on a on a product that um, that will I'm sure available soon. I'm not sure if uh, if in this season, but uh, with with a very good uh, property that um, it can increase even more uh, acidity, which is which is basic for so for sparkling wines, and um, uh, this product is uh, is also quite. Uh, um, uh, quite good in, in keeping the malic acids uh, and not allowing uh, spontaneous fermentation to happen. So it's um, it's a product that retains the full aspect of acidity and adds more, and adds as well on the, on maybe more of the the white um, white fruits, so stone fruits, um, it's like a peach and, and apricots. Uh, to it, so I, I I foresee that this product will become very very strong for for sparkling wines. All right, thank you. And you know, just from from my personal sp experience here in in North America, um, I've seen a lot of folks use uh, fruitsen, the the Picchia claveri, in the uh, the base wine production. Uh, some of the sparkling wine producers want to reduce the amount of SO2 that they're using or to yeah. avoid uh, oxidation and reduce the risk of yeah. contamination. So fruits in is certainly uh, something you might want to, to think about. And you know, I know uh, when I drink sparkling wine, I want something with a, a, uh, a full body, increased mouthfeel. And so I've seen some winemakers have a lot of success with Taurus Spora da uh, with our with our prelude to you know, build up that mouthfeel in the in the base wine, so those are uh, certainly some some products that you could uh, you could use. Uh, if any bacteria comes to mind, it's it's sine, uh, you know, a uh, a bacteria that isn't going to produce any diacetyl. And so, if you're looking for a real crisp, clean, sparkling wine, that might be a good good option for you. All right, so we have another question in. What is the different needs for yan on Saccharomyces versus non-Saccharomyces? Uh, it's it's a good and tough question. Uh, in the fact that um, there has been research out there to try to identify um, which are the uh, the essential amino acids that non certain non-Saccharomyces need and that they become limiting in a fermentation. Um, but in, to generalize it, um, let's say if you do co-inoculation or you, you, you clearly like you you do uh, you do want to mix in on saccharomyces saccharomyces, uh, you do want to add maybe 20% more of what its its usual um, yang level for saccharomyces only fermentation. And um, as I mentioned before, also like the fact of like maybe adding some DAP uh, when uh, Saccharomyces is being inoculated, uh, that helps to, um, to 
So basically leaving um, Jan a more complex um, nitrogen uh, for uh, for the non saccharomyces or otherwise for the malolactic bacteria. So um, our our experience is that uh, clearly like uh, Lachance and Douglaspora, Douglaspora is phys um, phylogenetically as well like uh, the closest to Saccharomyces. And um, we do see there that they, they do feed in a similar way. I mean, they go for the, for the same um, kind of peptides and same kind of uh, like uh, amino acids. So there you want you want basically to control it by, by adding a surplus of yan. With Pikia, uh, with Frutzen, um, we are seeing that uh, because it does a lot by consuming quite little, uh, we normally we don't need to add extra yan. So with, with fruits and uh, you should be uh, you should be quite um, all right, but just going with uh, with the normal dosage. But for concerto and, uh, and prelude, we we suggest to correct your yan to 118 to 100 ppm. Okay, thank you. And uh, one other thing that I would uh, mention from a commercial point of view is to be mindful that the rehydration process for some of the dry non-saccharomyces yeast like Torsplora delbruchia and Lachantia thermotolerans is a little bit different than Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, so Guzmar has a, a great video on their website, on their YouTube channel uh, to show you the, the differences um, in the re rehydration process between Saccharomyces and uh, non-saccharomyces. So we have one minute left, you know, and I'd like to just finish off with mentioning that you know you can use non-saccharomyces yeast for bioprotection, and you can also use non-saccharomyces yeast for product diversification and enhancing aroma and flavor and mouthfeel characteristics. Uh, so you have many options in your toolbox. Certainly reach out to uh, your Guzmer representatives if you have any questions about our yeast products and how they can work in your particular wines. Any final words, Lorenzo, before we close this, this webinar? <laughs> uh no, I mean, I, I, it was a pleasure. It's great, even though I can't, I can't see you. I, I, I truly, I truly hope that you, that you enjoyed and you, you, you actually learned something from this, uh, from this training, um, and from this presentation. Yeah, I believe that we all walked away from this presentation with it, a few nuggets of, of information that we can implement into our winemaking practices. So I want to thank you for taking the time to. Uh, share your knowledge and uh, your expertise on these strings. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>